There were not many Unitarian Universalists at my seminary, but our advisor, Professor Wenger, was just about the best advisor any UU could ask for. It wasn't just the chickens that she kept at her house that were beautiful, or the Subaru she drove. She wrote a lot. That's what you have to do to get tenure, I'm told, at a university. And she had her own private study, her own part of the library, a study carol. And above it was engraved the quote from Emerson, a scholar is persistence personified. And when she was addressing our wild little rabid UU band there, we asked her about her working on her latest book that she was going to have published. And that's when she said to us, I would not wish writing a book on my worst enemy. Now, mind you, I knew a thing or two, or I thought, about writing books. After college, I just took a proofreading and grammar exam and ended up working in publishing as a result. I'd help catch some errors here and there. I'd mostly enter changes to manuscripts that the real editors would make, deciding what would go and what we'd keep, what part of this astronomy textbook was most important. Once, once I even wrote an index. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So on this day when we're talking about pastoral care, I can tell you that as your minister, if you ever fear you would be wasting my time or boring me in any possible way. Please know that after writing indexes for a living, nothing you could ever do can bore me. <laughs> I don't think I would wish writing an index on my worst enemy. Now, in that world of publishing, of ruthless deadlines, of comments and questions about a writer's work, of peering into the sometimes bleeding heart of a author's manuscript that they'd spent years of their life working on. In that world, I heard a lot of things, but none of them was scarier than this. Kill your darlings, right? It's a phrase attributed to William Faulkner somewhat apropos. But versions of the sentiment can be found in all kinds of places, and it means to get rid of a writer's bad or lazy habits, to remove phrases or words or devices that you tend to use as a writer, but mostly overuse. After my time in publishing and hearing from my advisor about her own experience and I had a good sense of what a hard time writing a book must be. Now, my UU advisor, uh, you know, and I weren't the first Unitarians or Universalists to deal with some editing woes. The very foundation of Unitarian and Universalist thought were wrought from close and scholarly dissection of sacred texts to arrive at fundamental truths that felt real, of a unitary, not a trinitary God for Unitarians, and salvation for all, for Universalists. Today, some of us miss those scholarly days, right? We don't so much miss imprisonment <laughs> or fleeing Geneva by the seat of our pants, or capital punishment, all of which our religious ancestors to this tradition endured because of what they wrote about, the dominant religions of their time. I can only speak for myself, but I miss some of the seriousness with which we took real critical writing. Today, some of our critical thought is a little more like a punchline why are Unitarian Universalists so bad at singing hymns? Because they're too distracted looking ahead at the lyrics to see what might offend them. 
<laughs> Got it over there. <laughs> and some congregations, yeah, they edit the hymn that we just all sang together. Anyone know what some of those congregations sing instead? Wow, I love you. I, Beth knows, but I love that no one has done this here. Beth, what is it? There's more love right here. Yeah. They sing, there's more love right here. I kept on and I found it. There's more love right here. There are a few things that happen when you sing that hymn that way. Think about it a little bit. It might do different things to different people, this edit. You might react right away simply because someone has changed the lyrics of a spiritual from African-American religious traditions. But that's not all that's going on, right? It's complacent, that way of thinking. It lacks curiosity about changes to the world that might be possible to find more and more love, to keep looking and looking until you find it. Dr. Glenn Thomas Rideout, a truly gifted musical artist, minister, educator in the Unitarian Universalist movement, tells a story of being asked by a white person singing in one of his choirs why he doesn't sing this song in this edited way. After pausing for a moment to collect his thoughts, he offered his questioner some gracious and insightful words as a response. Among them were these, and I quote, I offered that if we as a spiritual community of Unitarian Universalists, populated by well-meaning people, are to mean anything to the lives and the deaths of people of color, we must begin by learning, not squelching, the forms of expression that arise from these living perspectives. And that incredibly generous teaching is at the heart of the worth and dignity engagement or weighed work that we do here at this church. The best and most powerful learning comes from genuine inquiry and appreciation it's even in the words of the song. There is more love somewhere. I'm going to keep on till I find it. I'm not going to rest and stop and be complacent. I'm not going to stop on my first try. Emerson said it. A scholar is persistence personified. In our reading today, Toni Morrison, one of the greatest novelists ever to live, shares about the importance of stories, yes. But she focuses on the people themselves who tell the stories. She shares about the threat posed to a society that stops telling stories, but again, and more insidious on what happens when we stop people, artists, writers in particular, from telling their stories. The peril she names is to the freedom in that society. And the peril is to the fabric of that society as a whole. This week marks Toni Morrison's birthday, February 18th, 1931. And many of you know she died not long ago in 2019. And for those of you who don't know, Toni Morrison is the author of some of the most important works of literature in history. She is one of only eight women to receive the Nobel Prize in Literature and was the first black woman of any nationality to win it. Now, on that basis alone, I want to go on record that I do not personally believe the committee selecting Nobel Prize winners is the first or the last word on just about anything. But the global community of literature, I think it's fair to say, recognizes the monumental contributions of Toni Morrison to its culture. That really mattered more to her anyway. And this week, a friend of mine 
sent me a clip from an interview that Toni Morrison gave a number of years ago. Morrison is a vision in it. She wore, she wore the kind of smile that could soak up a room and her hair had that touch of salt that only a good bit of living can earn us. And her interviewer, a white English woman, asked her questions. First, the interviewer asks Morrison why she didn't write even more about marginalized white characters that she mentions in some of her books. Morrison sort of cocked her head a little bit, but gave a beautiful response. She said, I was interested in a different kind of literature that was not just confrontational, black versus white. I was really interested in black readership. For me, the allegory or the parallel is black music, which is as splendid and complicated and wonderful as it is because its audience was within, its primary audience. The fact that it has become universal, worldwide, anyone, everyone can play it, and it has evolved, is because it wasn't tampered with and editorialized within the community. So I wanted the literature that I wrote to be that way. I could just go straight to where the soil was, where the fertility was in the landscape. And also, I wanted to feel free not to have the white gaze in this place that was so precious to me, which is the work. After a few moments, the interviewer said to Morrison, and you'll just stay in this safe place and not incorporate white lives into your stories substantially? Now, if it wasn't a serious interview, I might have thought it was a comedy sketch. I could imagine John Oliver asking that same question and giving Miss Morrison a great laugh. But this wasn't a joke. Now, on this video, and I watched it a few times, Morrison sadly doesn't seem surprised by the question. And she asks, you can't understand how powerfully racist that question is, can you? Hmm. Oh, it was beautiful. And then she actually smiles at the interviewer like you might a child and continues, because you would never ask a white author when are you going to write about black people, right? After the interviewer tried badly to explain herself or get out from under the ignorance of her question, Morrison pivots. She kind of lets her off the hook. After all, it's an interview on television. She says, I can't tell you how satisfying it is to know that I have earned a readership that is that large, as large as it is. I stood at the border, I stood at the edge and claimed it as central. Claimed it as central, she said it twice. And let the rest of the world move over to where I was. And in that explanation, she is literally explaining the power of art to decenter the dominant narrative and thrive. We heard it, right? This idea, this kind of accomplishment is something that Morrison takes very seriously. And perhaps it's part of what she tells the world in some of her greatest advice. If there is a book you don't see in the world, go and write it yourself. And a lot of amazing people have taken that advice and changed the world with their own words. Texas's, well, Houston's own Beyonce just broke the record for the total number of Grammys ever awarded to any artist this week. Just going to say. Morrison tells us in the reading that we heard 
Certain kinds of trauma visited on people are so deep, so cruel, that unlike money, unlike vengeance, even unlike justice or rights or the goodwill of others, only writers can translate such trauma and turn sorrow into meaning, sharpening the moral imagination. A writer's life and work are not a gift to mankind. They are its necessity. Throughout this month, especially, as raw as many of us are feeling with the killing of Tyree Nichols and the ways we keep understanding how hauntingly pervasive the kinds of violence and callousness are that led to that death, especially in this month when schools and other institutions take just a few weeks to remember civil rights marches and moments from the 60s, often punctuated with horrific images of lynching, of police dogs and water cannons. Some voices throughout this month call us to remember that if we're going to have different histories, if we're going to have one history month and another history month, that the racial violence, the predation remembered this month is white history, not black history. The violence is white history. Only writers can translate such trauma and turn sorrow into meaning, sharpening the moral imagination. A writer's life and work are not a gift to mankind. They are its necessity. Write the book that you don't see in the world. And I would not wish writing a book on my worst enemy. It's in the marriage of these ideas, the dream and the reality. It's in this marriage where we need each other, where we need church, friends. We've got to kill our darlings. It's the only way. These old ways that we think are easy, these habits we've used to get by, they're not wrong, they're not bad, they're not a moral judgment, but any editor worth their salt has got to ask, how can we stand at the border? How can we stand at the edge and claim as central, claim as central, she said it twice, and let the rest of the world move over to where we are? There's a lot coming out of the legislature, friends, and it is not where we are. That's what Toni Morrison did. And that's the book we've got to write. And I wouldn't wish it on an enemy. We're going to all need to try something new because for millennia, our ancestors in the Unitarian and the Universalist realms have kept watch for clarity and truth in the ways we are with one another and the ways our faith strives to meet people exactly where they are. Not because we are Unitarian, because we are humanitarian. Not because we are Universalist, but because we have an interest to keep the watch. And if someone isn't worried about us watching them, keepers of the flame of a free and fair exchange of ideas. If someone isn't wondering whether they're going to piss us off, well then, friends, we are not doing it right. Okay? <clears throat> Let me ask you something. How free do you want to be? Just a little free or damn free? You can say it. Well, in that case, <laughs> otherwise, this sermon was going in a whole different direction, friends. <laughs> and it wasn't going to be pretty. Some other time. In that case, we got to keep writing, friends. Writing the new story of the way each one of us is in the world, how we are working to make the border that we guard, where worth and dignity are engaged and where they all matter every day, every day for every 
person everywhere. How will we move that border that we guard to the center? We might have to write and write and write again. We might have to edit and edit and edit until we hardly recognize the draft. We might even have to make an index, but don't worry, I'm on it. We will work and work and work, keeping on until we find it, until the morning breaks on a day when we are at last the keepers of the flame of real liberty, when we are at last our sibling's keeper for real, when we are at last and forever each one of us free. How free do you want to be, church? Then we better keep on till we find it, along a road that may be weary and cold and dim at times, and across a river that might flood our souls, it is there waiting for each of us. We keep going. We keep working. We keep on until we find it, and that is what we must keep. May it ever be so, and amen.